Good morning, church. It is good to see everyone this morning. We welcome you to Gillsburg Baptist Church. If you're visiting with us, we want you to know uh, that we're so glad you chose to worship with us this morning, and you're welcome here at any time. If you would, please pull out your bulletin or pay attention to both uh, screens on either side of me. A few quick announcements this morning, and then I'll I'll turn it over to Brother Doug. Uh, VBS, Vacation Bible School T-shirts. Those T-shirt orders are due June the 1st. June the 1st, they're $12, and you can see Ashley Johnson. Uh, We really want to get these orders in uh, by June the 1st because, as you know, the world we're living in today, it's hard to get supplies. Uh, So we're trying to get these ordered and get these delivered uh, early uh, so we can get that handled. So VBS T-shirts, you see the the picture there of what the shirt looks like. Let Ashley know your size, and uh, they're $12 each. And those are due June the 1st, June the 1st. On May 22nd, May 22nd, we will recognize um, our seniors, our high school seniors. Uh, On May the 22nd, we will also uh, uh, let everyone know of all the college graduates uh, that graduated on that day as well. If you have a high school or college graduate that I don't already have on my list, please get me uh, that name as soon as possible. If you are a high school graduate or the parent or grandparent of a high school graduate, I need their senior portrait as well as a little info about them, such as where they're graduating, uh, where they plan to go in the future. So if you could get that for us, we would love to have that for the service on May the 22nd. I want to remind everyone of our Wednesday evening uh, activities. Uh, Supper begins at 530, prayer service at 6, and that's when the, the youth and GAs, RAs, and mission friends break out as well. And then please don't forget choir practice at 630. A uh, special announcement about Gillsburg Grub. Gillsburg Grub will not be delivering meals in the months of June and July. They will resume that in August. Uh, so just want to let everyone know who participates in that program or who may receive a meal uh, from them. There will be no meals in June and July. Uh, that will resume in August. I want to continue to remind you about our Annie Armstrong Easter offering uh, for North American Missions. That goal is 3,500. We're running that through the end of the month, so you've got a couple more weeks. If you'll pray about that and feel led to give to that, you can do so by placing a note on your check, or you can use the drop-down box on our online giving uh, to do that as well. And then last but not least, remember June the 20th through the 24th is VBS this year. So if you've signed up to help or if you have kids and grandkids uh, that typically come visit you, Uh, during that week to be a part of BBS. We would love to have them again and just want everybody to have that on your calendar and be prepared for that. Any other announcements that I need to make this morning before I step down? Oh yeah, that's my own announcement. Maxfield, we're starting back in Maxfield. Uh, As you know, the uh, church softball kind of league that we play in uh, on Hampley Road, uh, that begins on Tuesday evening, Tuesday evening, and we play the eight o'clock game the 8 o'clock game. So they start at 6. So if you just want to come out there and mingle and have a burger or a hot dog or something, you're more than welcome. But we don't play until 8 o'clock. And we play our good friends at Mars Hill. And we love them. They're brothers and sisters in Christ. But we also very much enjoy outplaying them uh, at Maxfield. So come check us out against Mars Hill Tuesday night, 8 o'clock. Lord willing, if we need to take the bus, the church bus, I will do that uh, since it's a late game. So let's just say we leave here at 7. So if you want to want to take the church bus, if you have kids that can't drive yet, um, I'll take the church bus. We'll leave here at 7 on Tuesday uh, to do that. Any other, thank you, Mr. Deborah, any other announcements for that to the, this morning? If not, you know, I always have a little nugget uh, that I get in my reading uh, during the week, and I found this one this week and I just thought I would share it to you it was a quote from Martin Luther and he said we need to hear the gospel every day because we forget it every day so just wanted to share that with you this morning it's good to see everyone we welcome you to Gillsburg Baptist Church and brother Doug it's all yours
Love reaches out to all to bring abundant life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Let's stand and let's share that love through song this morning. Share his love by telling what the Lord has done for you. Share his love by sharing of your faith. And show the world that Jesus Christ is in to you every moment, every day. Would you bow with me? Father, we are just truly blessed uh, each and every day, Lord, and truly blessed to be here this morning uh, together as a community and as a family and, and worshiping you and singing praises to your name. And we just thank you for this opportunity. We just pray, Lord, that your hands will be over this service, Lord, that everything that we do brings glory and honor to you. We just pray that you'll keep us safe as we're worshiping this morning and keep us safe as we depart here. Our hope and prayers are if there's someone here that doesn't know you, They'll come to know you this morning by the way we worship you and proclaim your name today. We just ask you, forgive us where we fail you, Lord, and continue to be with this church and be with the people of it and allow, allow us to be the light uh, that we need to be for this community, for this county, for this state, for this country, and for this world, Lord. We just want to proclaim you in everything that we do and all of our actions and all of the way that we speak and teach, Lord. We just, again, thank you for this opportunity this morning. We turn this service over to you. And we just pray, Lord, that you will work in each and every heart here. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, my little buddies, come on down. Man, he's all by yourself. All right, let's have a sit down, okay? Hasn't outside just been so wonderful? God just gave us that for getting out of school. And yesterday and today were so pretty, wasn't it? How did all that come about? How did the world get made? Right, Addie, Jesus. You know, one day God was sitting up in heaven and he said, hmm, it's awful dull up in here, no color. Nobody don't like it up in here with no color. So he says, he called Jesus and he called the Holy Spirit and he said, let us go do something about this. So you know what they did? On the first day, they didn't go to a science lab. They didn't go to Walmart and buy it. They simply said, day one, they simply said, let there be day and night. Day one, day and night. Pick me out a color marker that you would think would look like night. Black for night and, let's say, yellow for day. Okay? So God made the dark night and he made the pretty skies, pretty yellow sky. On day two, he said, hmm, I like black and yellow, but let's look at, for another color. So he made the sky and the air and everything. What color are we going to make the sky? Lenny, we're going to make the sky blue. We don't like it black when it's raining like the other day, do we? We like it nice and blue with those pretty clouds in it. Isn't that wonderful how God made that, just blue and some clouds? You ever look up in there and see an animal or a face? I love to do that. So then he said, Jesus and Holy Spirit... Let us go and make the ground and the trees and flowers. So what color will we use for the brown, Kyle? Brown. What color will we use with the trees, Tommy? Green. Get you a green one. What color will we use for flowers, Lenny? Pink. Purple and pink. Addie, what color? We're not going to make a black flower, are we? Let's make another color. What color are we going to make? A red. I love red flowers. Lenny, uh, huh? Roses. But my favorite is yellow roses. Do you know, do I have any yellow roses at my house? No. Y'all need to talk to Mr. Tommy about that. Lenny, I mean, Rylan, what colors your flowers? Pink. I like you not to be talking. So on day four, he said, how about we make something to warm the earth and to make a little light at night? We're going to make the moon like an orange. You ever seen a pretty orange? It's going to be a pretty moon tonight. It's called a blood moon. It's going to be kind of red. God just does so many marvelous things up in the sky and in the earth. What color is the sun, um, Luke? Yellow. 
Then on day five, he said, we're going to make some animals, I mean, some birds and some fish. What color are we going to do birds? Any color we want to. There's a black bird, a buzzard, a green bird, a yellow bird, a blue bird, a red bird. My hummingbirds are all different colors, and they just swarm in my house. A parrot, that's right. Then on day six, he said, we're going to make some animals. What color are we going to make our animals? Black, brown, yellow cat, red. Oh, you're going to die animals? <laughs> okay. So that's day six. All he had to do was say, let us go. Let there be. That's a pretty good God, isn't it? Pretty awesome God that he can just say, let there be. But remember, Jesus and the Holy Spirit were up in there. Do you remember what the Trinity is? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three in one. Okay, boys, let's not be, be swords. So, day seven, what do you think he made on day seven? He rest. Adam and Eve. He rest. And he also made us. He made white us. He made black us. He made brown us. He made yellow us. The black did not sin. No, they're, they're not. But they're, uh, black means sin. Yeah. So, but he made all different colors. So God made everybody. God didn't just make the white people. He made everybody, right? So I got you some markers, and this week when you're not going to school and you're bored, pull you out a pack of markers, and remember, God made everything so we could have beautiful color in the world. Okay? Can we do that? Okay, Luke, you praying today? Dear God, thank you for this day. I My mommy and daddy, and my Mimi, and my grandpa, and my whole family. Amen. 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 Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, every color, every race, all are covered by his Jesus loves the little children of the world. Share his love. Let's sing a couple of hymns about his love. To God be the glory, and I stand amazed. Let's stand as we sing, please. To God be the glory.
Lord, we do love you, Lord, and we thank you for the blessings of this day, Lord, for all that you bless us with, Lord, for the, the health and the opportunity to come here this morning and together and worship together, Lord. Lord, I thank you for each and every one that's here this morning. Lord, we pray for the ones that couldn't be here for whatever reason, Lord. We just pray that our praise and worship here is worthy to you this morning, Lord. We pray this morning that you anoint our pastor and fill him with your message, Lord, and give us open and attentive hearts and ears and minds, Lord, that we might take this message and use it through the week to come, Lord. We thank you and we praise you for all that we are and all that we'll ever be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I can't forget when God saved my soul, nothing compares, nothing comes close. You can search far and wide. For what this world could never provide Once you've tasted the goodness of mercy And you've drunk from the fountain of grace Seen the power of God's forgiveness face to face Once you've known untold there's no brokenness that he can't make home you can search for a wide for what this world can never provide once you taste it
all God's people said. Amen. Thank you, guys, for a great job. Thank you for the good music this morning all the way around. Thank you for being here today. It's good to see you in God's house today, and thank you for your faithfulness. If you have your copy of God's Word, turn with me to the 25th chapter of the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 25 gives to us an accounting of one of the parables in the life of Jesus. And I want us to look at this today, thinking about this topic. I've entitled this message, Parable or Promise. Parable or Promise. I'm reading this morning a little different translation. I'm reading from the New Living Translation for its uh, impressive beauty to me, but for the extreme clarity of the language that it uses in our modern day English. Matthew chapter 25, and we'll begin reading here in verse 14. The scripture says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground, and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done. My good and faithful servant, you have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money. So I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with the ten bags of silver. Verse 29 says, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what they have will be taken away. Now, throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It was perhaps a little over 50 years ago now that I entered Southwest Mississippi Community College to complete my education. And there I became acquainted with a dear lady in my second year whose name was Miss Olive Hay. Perhaps some of you encountered her. She was the quintessential English and literature teacher. She was brilliant. 
and hard at the same time. Demanding, maybe, was a better word for it. She didn't cut much of anybody any slack. Many was the morning that I traveled to school over there and, and caught her as she was leaving her car. And uh, I would have my piece of poetry that I had to memorize ready to recite for her. And there I would catch her as she would swing around out of her car and she'd say, all right, as I stood on the curb, she would just sit in the car, go ahead. <laughs> And you'd stand right there in the parking lot and say that poetry. And, oh, it was so good to get that checkoff mark we were doing, you know. And Miss Hay didn't, um, didn't just restrict her teaching to English and literature, but, but she covered a little bit of everything. She was a devout Methodist, if I remember correctly. But in Southwest Community College, in sophomore literature, I distinctly remember her teaching us about parables. And I remember the definition of a parable that she gave to us. She said, remember this, a parable is nothing more than an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Now, since that time, I've heard theologians and Ph.D. college professors and others preach and speak and teach. And I've never heard a better definition from a parable than I learned at Southwest from Miss Hay. You see, to remember that, that an earthly story with a heavenly meaning it is appropriate because everything that Jesus said and taught is important and it's worth remembering. But if you look at Jesus' teaching in the, as a body in God's Word, if you have one of those red letter editions like I do, you, you look through those pages and there are page after page with, with those red letters, all of those the words of Jesus. Notice when you do so how often he teaches with stories, illustrations we call them sometimes, parables we note them sometimes. And remember that a parable is exactly what Miss Hay said, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Simple yet profound, easy to remember most of the time and even easier sometimes to tell or retell, but brilliant in their design and construction, brilliant in the multiple studies that they can provide for us, more profound thoughts as we study them come to the fore, deeper thoughts surface as we look at them. And today's focus is such captivating and yet profound in its illustration of something for us. I want you to see this. Here, here is a captivating thought about this story in the 25th chapter of the book of Matthew. I don't know how many times I've read this and, and even how many times I've preached about it, but I know I've studied it a number of times over the years. But I never really realized Jesus told this parable twice. In Matthew 25, he tells it once but also in the 19th chapter of the book of Luke. For the first time, he told it in Luke's record. And that was in a, a public setting. He had a crowd of individuals there. Secondly, he told it a few days later in a private setting with nothing but the 12, nothing but the disciples. And we read Matthew's account there a minute ago. There are, if you look at those two stories side by side, some minor differences. But the similarities are much, much greater and far outweigh the differences. In both cases, Jesus has a purpose. He is teaching how we are to live between his ascension and his second coming. That is where we find ourselves today. 
So I think that this bears note. We cannot, we must not ignore exactly where we are today because Jesus has ascended and gone back to heaven and here we await his second coming and he has told us exactly how we are to live. And so I want you to see some simple things that I find in the recounting of this parable. Is it a parable or a promise? A parable or a promise? Firstly, I want you to see the setting. In Luke's version, as I said a moment ago, Luke chapter 19 and following, Jesus tells this story to a, to a crowd of people. Go there and find Luke chapter 19 and read those verses, beginning in about verse 11 and following, about 15 or 16 verses. Jesus tells that crowd something very important. They were looking for the kingdom of heaven to come just any moment. They thought it was, it was imminent. And Jesus said, it, it's probably not imminent. It's probably not imminent. It's coming. And when they entered Jericho, they, they thought he was, he was coming. They thought he was coming to establish his kingdom in, in, in Luke 19. They, they, were, well, they were shouting at him. They thought he was coming in to establish his rule and reign. But Jesus said, not so. And then he told them how they were to live. But secondly, uh, the class. First he taught to a crowd, and secondly to a class. He had this captive audience, you see, of the disciples, the twelve. In, in Matthew's account that we read in Matthew chapter 25, he teaches them privately. Now remember, there are, there are several minor differences in these two accounts, but I want you to read them, Luke 19 and Matthew chapter 25. Read them parallel one day when you have a few minutes. It won't take you a few minutes to read both of them. There are a couple of things to note. He said to them, all of them, the crowd and to the disciples, the kingdom is coming. God's kingdom is going to come on earth. And the important thing for you to remember is that it is coming. It may not be imminent. It may not be today. In fact, he said it won't be today. But he told them twice. He taught this parable, this earthly story, with a heavenly meaning twice. And he is emphasizing something here that we must not miss. So with that having been said as the setting, look then at the story. Look at the story, if you will, with me. After you read these, I want you to think about these few salient points there. There is, there is power in this plot. This, this story is quite simple. It is easy to believe that this could have actually happened. But Jesus recounted this story. He said a man went on a journey and he is leaving some of his estate. He doesn't really say that it's all of his estate, not all of his liquid money, just some of it. But he left, however you read the story, a considerable sum in the care of some servants. Now, that is certainly a, a plausible story, not unbelievable at all. Luke's account is interesting. The rich man, Jesus notes, was also a noble man. And he was leaving for a purpose. Luke says that the purpose of his journey was he was going to a far country, evidently a place where uh, in the distant land where there were people who were higher than he was and they were going to crown him king of the area in which he inhabited. And then he was going to return. Now, you'll note then a problem in the plot. You'll see a problem in the plot there because the elders got together when the nobleman left. They didn't want him to be king. And they said, let's do something about this. And so they sent a delegation. They said, go to those in positions of responsibility who are going to crown this man king and tell them that we don't want him to be king. In fact, Luke's account says they hated him. They hated him. They didn't want him crowned. They didn't want him ruling over them. They didn't want him back even. That's just a problem in the story. But then see the parallels in this 
plot here. Now, the audience might not have caught this, that Jesus was talking to at, at this point in time. Some say we are to never allegorize, if you will, a parable. That is, say, this event, and that means so-and-so. This event, that means so This person, and that represents her. that. I, I personally think we have to do that. I think we must do that. In, in, in just over a week, the truth is here that these people that Jesus is talking to, and some are, are waving him on and urging him to establish his kingdom, and please make your kingdom be imminent. We want it to be now. These same people are going to be saying, crucify him, crucify him. There's, there's a problem and a parallel in, in this plot here. You see, he in truth was already a king. Jesus didn't have to go to a far country and be crowned a king. He was a king in a far country. He had already come. and He was already a king. They had missed that. They somehow missed that, and, and he will still return as a king. But these individuals hated him as well. There was a certain amount of them that didn't want him to be king. They weren't having him as king, you see. And then in the parallels, you'll see as you read these two stories together, twice told parable. The word is translated very often in many translations, talent. Talent. Now, that can be a measure we can also expand that somewhat. I like the more modern translation because I think the modern translation just boils it down. But, but talent, when describing what he gave to his servants, is translated in the modern translating as a bag of silver. It could be equated to an amount of money. It is in some translations. And we could extrapolate that out and say, well, it was, it was so much. It was so many days' wages. And in that particular time, it would be a, a, a princely sum in our day. But you see, Jesus is not necessarily teaching or talking about money. Money is a measure. Money is a tool. And Jesus may have, have used that illustration as a nothing more than a vehicle. But remember, Jesus is not teaching money here. Jesus is teaching life. He is teaching us how to live between the time in which he ascended into heaven and the time he is coming back. So what, what are we to do? What are the possibilities? There, there is a key thing key thing about the possibilities in the return of this noble man. He returns. Differing amounts are given to these servants in the account that we read. Uh, the, the, the servants differ, but the basic plot is the same, whichever account you take. Luke gives to us more details than Matthew, but, but the bottom line, as we would say, is that the master returns. In Luke's account, there were ten servants and ten bags of silver that were divided among them according to their abilities, he says. And in Matthew, there were less servants, and they got differing amounts. One servant got, as we read, five bags of silver. And he immediately went and began to invest it, and when the master returned, which he did, he got a five-fold return, bag for bag. He started out with five bags, and when the master came back, he had ten. He had doubled the master's money. Exceptionally good, wonderful work, and he was praised. Let's celebrate together. The second didn't get quite as much. He got two bags, but he also did well. He invested his money, doubled his return, and got four bags to give back in place of two. Very good. The same commendation. Well done. The same commendation. Let's celebrate together. The same celebration. Servant number three got one bag and did nothing. Moreover, he dug a hole and put it in the ground, and covered it up, and sat on it. In fact, he was saying, I want to keep it safe. He was lying. He was lying. That was an excuse. He didn't have anything to show at all. He, he didn't even put it in an interest-bearing account in the bank and get a little bit of interest on it. And oddly enough, if you read that 
carefully. Look again at verse 24. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man. Do you believe that? He blamed the master for his incompetence. He blamed the master for his inactivity. He blamed the master for the fact that he buried his one talent in a hole in the ground and sat on it and had nothing to show when his master came back. Lord, I knew you were a hard man. I knew, I knew you harvested where you didn't plant and, and you took crops that weren't He accused him of being a thief. I knew. What did he know? I'll tell you what he knew. He was only concerned with himself. That's all he knew. I believe that in his heart of hearts, he really didn't think that the master was coming back. In fact, he hoped he didn't. And he said, when he comes back, he, I don't think he's coming back. And I really hope he doesn't come back. And when he doesn't come back, all of this is going to be mine. That's what he really thought. He really thought only of himself. But note, note. The bottom line, the real key in the parable is it a parable of promise. The master did return. He came back and he asked for an accounting. And the principles in the outcome, the details differ slightly, but the outcome is the same. The one who was the most faithful obtained more. Commendation, reward. But selfishness and hate brought its own punishment and loss and destruction. The king, the master of the land, oversees well everything, everything. And he gives to those who manage it more. You think for a moment. You have maybe some retirement funds. You have some savings that you entrust to somebody, maybe to a banker, maybe to a broker, maybe to a financial manager of some kind. And after a while, your expectation as time goes on is, is growth and safety and liquidity, as they say. And you, you look and you see, well, my account balance is the same thing as it was hasn't done anything at all. You call the guy up and you say, oh, well, this so-and-so, and you know this, you know that's happened, this happened. And uh, the answer is just not really what you want to hear. And you begin to look at things, and, and it seems like not only is there not what you expected, there may be even some of it may be missing. And there may be some fraudulent activity here. And, and so what do you do? You get really suspicious about this because this is what you're depending on for your nest egg, if you, as you say, for your retirement for in, in your golden years. And wisdom says you take those funds and you take them out of that man's hands and you put them somewhere else. You do something else. You give it to somebody else. Remember, Jesus here is not talking just about money. He's using that as a vehicle, as an illustration for us. He's given all of us a little of that. He has entrusted us with, with some of that, but how much more? In how much larger fashion has he given to us time and skills and opportunities and relationship and days set aside called Sundays for worship and rest and recreation? Yes, funds. But how about all these other things? What, what have we done with them? What are we doing with them? That's the, the story. But thirdly, look quickly at the substance here, the meaning. Again, the story couldn't be simpler. It couldn't be more direct. It, couldn't, it could certainly have happened. And Jesus is describing how we should live between his ascension and his promise that he's coming back. The substance of that story is he is and he is a king. When he comes back, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Excuses won't matter then. There, there is one clear teaching in this parable here. Oh, some would say as they read it, we, that, that's a harsh God. That's a harsh teaching you have about God. That he, he threw this servant out. He cast this servant out of heaven. Not so. Not so. You see, 
It wasn't because of his non-production and his no return on the bag of silver. It wasn't because of his stewardship. He had a problem with lordship. And Jesus the King will not accept excuses. His work ethic was not the issue here. Lordship is. This is not a salvation and works issue here. The king's enemies, as we said a moment ago, didn't want him to be king because they hated him in their heart. And they said, go and tell him, don't make him king because we won't have him. That was, that was no hint as I read both of these stories in Jesus' words. There was no hint of repentance. There was no hint from this lazy servant of anything that said, I'm sorry. Somehow, in my mind's eye, I believe that that master could have accepted if that servant had said, Lord, I just, I didn't know what to do, and I'm sorry. I, I, I think there was simply no room here with blame and contempt and lack of lordship and hatred in his heart. There was no room for mercy and grace, none whatsoever. I don't believe God is going to cast any of us out of heaven. But we can seal the deal, in other words, for ourselves with this issue of lordship. So the setting and the story and the substance and the significance, what do we take home from this? I'm going to just quickly give you four things. If you miss everything else, that's understandable. But just make note of these four things. God created us equal in value. Not equal in talents. Not equal in skill. Not equal in ability. God has diversity in his creation. Marvelous multifaceted diversity. You and I both look, and we look at some folks and say, man, that individual seems like they have it all. They, they are multi-talented man. They're multi-talented woman. Look at the number of things she can do. Look at how many things he has successful. And then, you know, I know a lot of folks, and just one talent, that's it. And they may struggle with that one. Th this parable teaches us, I think, that God blesses us for who we are, not for what we have as far as skills and talents and abilities. He has blessed us all with value. Secondly, the second thing for you to take home, God, God doesn't judge what you have, but what you do with what you have. He doesn't judge what you have. The scripture in that verse that we read a moment ago said he divided it in proportion to their abilities, Matthew chapter 25. He doesn't judge what we have, but, but he does what we do with it. What are we doing with it? He expects us to be good stewards. Did you ever stop to think, as you read this parable, how much effort did it take for the two bag of silver guy to get two more in comparison to the five bag of silver guy who got five more? I'd be willing to bet you that the two bag guy may have worked harder. Think about that. He doesn't judge what we have, but what we do. That's why the servant's reward is the same. The king measures our success by effort, according to Jesus' teaching here. Thirdly, God, God is going to hold us accountable. Just as the nobleman did who came back as a king, according to Luke, just as he did, just as he called them in and held them accountable, God is going to do this, this is not a threat. It's a promise. It's a promise from this parable. This parable is, is really, I think, this earthly story with a heavenly meaning is a, 
is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us today. And for and finally, God is more concerned with our heart than he is with our performance. You see, the issue is not two bags of silver or five more bags of silver or even one bag of silver. The issue, the issue is lordship. It's lordship. There was a problem in the heart here. And the parable teaches that the lazy servant's real problem was the fact he hated his master as evidence by his lack of doing anything, lack of effort, totally. God, God is not going to cast you and me out of heaven because we lost some of his money. He's not going to cast us or not let us into heaven because we didn't perform or maybe we performed poorly or maybe we failed completely. But if Jesus is not your Lord and Savior and he is not Lord of your life, there is a clear lesson because many will reject his invitation of salvation. They will hate him, they will reject his lordship, and they will choose something else as evidenced by the way many live today apart, that many will choose to give him no return on his gracious gift. It may be your money, but it may well be your time and your talents and your abilities and the lordship of your life. That's the simple truth. Parable or promise? Earthly story with a heavenly choice is yours. Would you pray with me? Let me just ask you, nobody looking around, nobody but God really looking. God is seeing and knows our heart of hearts this morning. Who are you really serving? What are you really doing with that which God has graciously entrusted to you. Maybe it is your bag of silver. Maybe he's given you beyond measure and you have withheld from him. You have just simply thumbed your nose in his face and grasped it like a child with a toy saying, mine. Maybe you need to settle that issue today. God says, to whom much is given, much is required. But to those who make Jesus Lord and give back to him in proportion, blessings will come in, in proportion and in abundance. Jesus said, I'm coming that you might have life and have it more abundantly. What about your time? What about your talents and your skill and your opportunities? and your Sundays, your days of worship, are they yours for rest and, and recreation? Or do you really follow his dictate and where he says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? Do you follow that? I'm just asking you to be honest. You don't have to, you're not gonna have to answer to me. I'm not the noble man that's going to return. But I can assure you on the authority of his word, he is going to return. And he will get an account. How do you stand with him today? Is he Lord of your life? Do you know him as personal Savior and Lord? Have you invited him in and asked him as you repent of your sins to cleanse you of all unrighteousness and forgive you? He's promised that he'll do that. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You can do that today. Would you do it just now? In this invitation time, if there's a decision that you need to rest or otherwise, if you need to come on transfer of a letter in any other way that we receive members, the doors of the church are open right now. You can come and be saved. You can come and transfer that letter. You can make Jesus Lord of your life. Whatever you need to do today, 
would you come in an act of repentance and renewal and rededication this morning? Father, bless this invitation. It's yours. It is totally and completely yours. We stand naked, as it were, before you bear. For you know our hearts better than we know them ourselves. So as you reveal sin to us, help us that we may confess it and forsake it and that we might trust you as Savior and Lord just now. I pray that you be honored by the decisions that we make before we leave this place this morning and that we go from this place rejoicing, celebrating together. Bless, we pray, in this invitation just now. Brother Doug's going to lead us in a couple of verses of speak to my heart. And as he does so, if God has laid a decision on your heart, you need to come. Would you come on? Come on, make that decision.